Neil Ratna Rakdak here with a story on a very cold morning from Woodstock, New York. I think today the temperature is going to get to be maybe five degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> At any rate, okay. I'm sure most of you have heard the story of how senior A&R man for Decca Records, Dick Rowe, turned down the Beatles. Well... The true story is a bit different than what most people think. <laughs> but a little background first, all right. Dick Rowe was one of the most important producers and record executives in the UK in the 50s and early 60s. And it was Rowe who was responsible for signing many important bands, including the Moody Blues, the Zombies, Van Morrison's group Them, John Mayall's Blues Breakers, The Small Faces, <laughs> the list goes on and on. Many, many, many others. I mean, the guy was a giant, truly a giant. Okay, so Roe had heard about the Beatles from one of his guys, Mike Smith, who happened to catch a Beatles show at the Cavern Club in Liverpool during the month of December in 1961. Now, Smith wasn't convinced that the Beatles should be signed, and didn't have signing power anyway. But he liked them enough to convince Rowe and Decca to pay for a recording session on New Year's Day at their studios in West Hampstead, London. Okay, now, the group at the time was John, Paul, George, and drummer Pete Best. This was even before Ringo was in the band. All right, so the band traveled down to London from Liverpool and they were driven there by Rody Neil Aspinall. But they hit really bad weather and they got to the studio just in time for their 11 o'clock start. Brian Epstein was already there as he had taken the train. Dick Rowe wasn't even planning to come to the studio. Again, he left it to Mike Smith, who arrived very late after partying on New Year's Eve the night before. Epstein was pissed and later said, I was pretty annoyed, not because we were anxious to tape our songs, but because we felt we were being treated as people who didn't matter. <laughs> now, to add insult to injury, Smith felt the Beatles' gear was substandard, and according to Aspinall, we had to use theirs. We needn't have dragged our amps all the way from Liverpool. <laughs> Brian Epstein insisted the Beatles stick mostly to standards, since demos and auditions were recorded in a single take without overdubs. So the Beatles played 15 songs, and the whole session took about an hour. Now, by all accounts, things did not go well. According to Aspinall, Paul couldn't sing one song. He was too nervous, and his voice started to crack up. <laughs> they were all worried about the red light. I asked if it could be put off, but we were told people might come in if it was off. You what, we said? We didn't know what all that meant. <laughs> now, later that day, another group called Brian Poole and the Tremolos auditioned. And according to Dick Rowe, I told Mike he'd have to decide between them. It was up to him. The Beatles or Brian Poole and the Tremolos? He said, mm, they're both good, but one's a local group. The other comes from Liverpool. We decided it was better to take the local group. We could work with them more easily and stay closer in touch as they came from Dagenham. Okay, so let's listen to a little of this other group, Ryan Bull and the Tremolos, which, by the way, has been around for 50 years. <laughs> Nice harmonies. So that's the group they decided to take. <laughs> now, 
an interesting footnote. Brian Epstein was mad as hell and didn't give up easily. He had further meetings with the sales department at DECA promising that he would buy 3,000 copies of any single of the Beatles that DECA would release. Dick Rowe was never told about this and later on he said, and I quote, the way economics were in the record business then, if we'd been sure of selling 3,000 copies, we'd have been forced to record them whatever sort of group they were. And think about this for a minute. If the Beatles had signed to Decca, Pete Best probably would have stayed their drummer. And the audition gave Brian Epstein some good quality takes to take around. And when Sid Coleman, a music publisher, heard the three original songs on the tape, he not only offered the group a publishing deal, but introduced them to George Martin, the head of A&R for Parlophone Records, and the rest, as they say, is rock and roll history. And by the way, George said, George Martin, that is, said, based on those tapes, he wouldn't have signed the Beatles either. <laughs> and in a way, the Beatles repaid Roe when George Harrison insisted that Dick sign this new band called the Rolling Stone. <laughs> so, that's my story. I hope you enjoyed it. Neil Ratner, Rock Doc. Stay warm if you're anywhere where this cold weather is. Have a great day, and I'll see you for another story tomorrow. Let's go out with the tremlos. All right. <laughs> Have a great day. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>